And now with today's lesson, Dr. Lester Sumrall. Now, yeah, welcome you to Ecstasy. We've taught on many subjects, uh, hundreds of lessons, and I love it. I truly love it. Uh, I have been prepared uh, for my total life for this moment, for this moment of teaching you the great uh, simple truths of God's Word. And it's a great joy to bring this special series uh, to you called Ecstasy. There are ten of them. God gave them birth in my heart over the Atlantic Ocean and on the continent of Africa. In Algiers, Algeria, I wrote for two nights, just <laughs> uh, couldn't stop about ecstasy. And God wants you to have ecstasy. The lessons are called, What is Ecstasy? What does it mean to be joyful, truly joyful? Uh, the birth of ecstasy. How does it get born? Do you find it in a casino? Uh, do you find it in a, a disco? Uh, where do you find ecstasy? Where does it come from? Do you find it in drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, tobacco, uh, the dance floor? Where do you find ecstasy? Uh, the birth of it, we tell you about it in lesson two. Lesson three, ecstasy in the human mind. That's very important because the mind is the channel through which ecstasy flows to the total being. Ecstasy in the subconscious mind, that not only can you be happy in your consciousness, you can be happy in your subconsciousness, and we believe that. And the, the, what ecstasy is not, it's very important to me, it, it's not uh, the guru, <laughs> and it's not oriental meditation, and it's not ESP. We're talking about something not from the outside, but from the inside, flowing forth from us that is so beautiful. We want you to know that. And today's lesson, the God of ecstasy. Uh, it's very difficult to know just how we should give these lessons. Uh, we don't think the God of ecstasy should be lesson six, excepting we wanted to introduce the studies to you very strongly. But now we have come to the point when we must identify, truly identify, the source of ecstasy, which is God, and that we know the God of ecstasy. In the book of Nehemiah, and chapter 8 and verse 10, we're given a very tremendous, you know, illumination from God. It says, the joy of the Lord, uh, that's Jehovah, is your strength. Now, uh, it takes quite a bit of thinking for us to come to the, the truth of that great uh, word that God has given us. That divine strength uh, comes to us and it comes to us in joy, that God's joy is our strength. We have strength, and it's God's joy that brings it to us, that the joy of Jehovah is our strength. And what a beautiful thing it is that we've got a God of joy, and he gives joy uh, to friends like you and myself that want this joy. Now, I have seen many gods of the nations. Uh, when I was only 20 years old, I became a missionary. And in a hundred nations of the world I went. I've seen inside the Tibetan temples. I've slept inside of them. I've slept right down under Buddha on my little cot. And he was 20 foot high above me there. And uh, we saw their gods, gods of anger. They have ugly gods that frighten you. And gods of wrath that hurt you, you know. Only the imaginary, the people believe in them. Gods of vengeance, get even with you, get even with you. And gods of retribution, I'm going to hurt you because you hurt me. I'm going to hurt you. You sinned and I'm going to make you pay for it. And these are ugly, mean, unmerciful gods. We don't serve such a god. We serve the true god of ecstasy. That's who we serve. And the joy of that god is our strength. We live by the joy that comes from that god. We face all the tomorrows because of the joy that we receive from that God. The joy of God is our strength. You should study that, as I mentioned a few moments ago, very carefully, exhaustively. It's in Nehemiah 8 and 10. This brings us to the thought of the emotional nature of our God. Now, for a finite creature, such as you and myself, to seek to define the personality of an infinite God, one who created the entire universe, is to say the least, a difficult assignment. How are you going to, in our finite limabilities, uh, understand the infinite? 
But we have, have a source of revealed knowledge uh, through the Word of God and through our lives that we have lived for Him. And it reveals His majesty and His glory, His temperament, and the many things that we'd like to know about Him. God's positive intelligence, God's positive energy becomes a constant source of strength, of comfort, of joy, of knowledge to those who have come to know Him. We serve, we know, a God of ecstasy. We're seeking to have a comprehensive knowledge of this God. We seek to know the duty given to all us as humans, that we seek out this God, that we come to know Him. In fact, the, the greatest thing that you could know and should know is to know this God, real and true and great. In the Bible, which all of us have one, I'm sure, if you just have one close by, hold it in your hand. In that book that you hold in your hand, there are 20,000 references to God. The Bible opens in the book of Genesis, if you'll open it now to the first page of the Bible. In Genesis 1 and 1, you'll find there that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first thing you know about God is that He is a creator, not a destroyer. He didn't come with a hammer to knock something to pieces. The first knowledge that you have of God is that He produces. That's what He still does today. He produces a new nature within me. He produces a new joy in my heart. He is a producer. He is an originator of good things, of great things, of wonderful things. In verse 2, it says, In the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. This means that His Spirit moved to create order in the cosmos. And so the second thing we find about God is that He has a Spirit and that the Spirit moves within Himself to create, to bring into being order and to bring into being beauty in the cosmos. So that's the second thing you find out about God. In verse 3, the same God said, and let there be light, dispelling the darkness. So the third thing you know about God is He is a God of light. That's, that's ecstasy, you see. A God of light. So in the first three verses, you find out something. Number one, there is a God. Elohim. There is a God. He produces. He is constructive. He makes things. He is a creator. He is an originator. Number two, that he has a spirit that moves and brings out of chaos, cosmos. That things that are ruffled up and things that are bad, he brings them into order. Same in your home. When God moves into your home, he takes the chaos and brings order out of it. Same in your life. For there's chaos, he brings order into your life. Same God, same work. Doing it today. In verse 4, it says, And God saw that it was good. This is an emotional nature. He was satisfied. There are people that do things that are never satisfied. There are people that do things and actually knock them to pieces. They don't like what they've done. God was satisfied. He said it's good. So we, here we find the, the, the powers of satisfaction in the moral nature of God. In verse 18 of that uh, same chapter, he divided the darkness from the light. He might have made the world a spin in order to do that, you know. <laughs> Whatever he did, he had to do, he did it. And he said it was good. It was good. He liked it. It was good. That's something further about the, the greatness of God and the moral nature of God. He didn't want darkness and light together. So he separated them. It's the same today. If you're light, he doesn't want you dark, you see. Uh, if you've got goodness in you, he didn't want badness in you at the same time. And if there's badness there, which is darkness, he takes that out and puts in the light, which is the goodness. That's what God wants to do for all of us. Verse 22, it says, God spoke to the animals, the birds, and said, Be fruitful and multiply after your own kind. Here, he says, be like me. I produce, I create. You do the same thing. 
In verse 26, God made man in his own image and likeness, and God desired reproduction. He desired love. He said, I want you to love me, and I'm making you a, a person that can love me. And so you find in the first chapter of the book uh, much about the moral nature of God, the emotional nature of God, uh, what is God like. You find so much of it in the first chapter of the Bible. You don't have to look very far. The oldest book in the Bible, we're told, is the book of Job. And in Job chapter 38 and verse 7, it says, And the morning stars sang together. The morning stars sang together. This means that before there was ever a man, before there was ever anyone that could put music together, down here, that in the universe there was music in the universe. And that music speaks of happiness and music speaks of ecstasy. And so the world knew ecstasy before man ever came to dwell on the earth because God spoke to Job and says, where were you when the morning stars sang together? And so there was singing before there was a man. And so that helps us to know something about our God, that our God is a God of ecstasy. When we read about who is God in the Bible, uh, what is God, the first uh, page we have to come to is that God is love. I think if you were to miss that, uh, you would miss the whole of God, which would be a tragedy. That God is love. In the New Testament, we, we call the golden text, John 3, 16. It says, God loved the world and gave his son. God loved the world. He wasn't paying a debt or getting a business transaction going. It was love. So we find and discover that the one that we, that we come to know as God is also love. I hope you appreciate that. I'm glad God is not power because power can be used the wrong way. I'm got, glad he's not justice because justice can be to your disadvantage. But if love, then love can look over a multitude of sins and forgive you. I'm glad that God is love. Love is a very important part of ecstasy. In fact, there cannot be ecstasy without love. No creature can be supremely happy that doesn't love. It isn't possible. No person with hate can ever claim ecstasy. If there's hate in your heart, you can never have ecstasy till you get the hate out. So the first thing that we learn about God is that he is a God of love. The Bible says so. And of course, uh, all through the Bible, it uh, reveals this. Also, we discover in the Bible regarding God that God is rich in mercy. In Ephesians 2 and 4, it says that God is rich in mercy. And how glad we are uh, that we are serving a God whose attributes have to do with mercy because mercy is an attribute of ecstasy. You cannot have true ecstasy without mercy. It, <coughs> if you're hard inside <coughs> and if if every man has to pay you his just due, then you're not, excuse me, you're not happy. It's not possible for you to be happy because mercy and ecstasy go together and only the merciful can be happy. And if you don't have mercy, you can't know happiness. That's beautiful, isn't it? Only a merciful God can reach in the heights of heaven to fulfill his destiny in our lives. And only you with mercy in your heart can reach to those heights of fulfillment and have true ecstasy. Ecstasy comes with mercy. God is a God of mercy. In this lesson, we're trying to find out the God of ecstasy. What kind of God is this? If the joy of God is our strength, how do we get into that God and know that joy? It's very simple. The Bible says here that God was one that was well pleased with what someone else did. And that's a part of our temperament and a, a part of our being and part of what we are. Uh, God the Father, speaking of his son in Matthew 4, said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so God spoke of Christ as he was being baptized in water in Matthew chapter 4 and said, This is my beloved son. And beloved speaks of something too, of the nature of God. But I am well pleased. Now, if he was well pleased with Jesus, he can be well pleased with you too. Aren't you glad for that? 
You can please him just like Jesus did. And he can be saying to the angels this very moment, uh, this is Sam Jones in whom I am well pleased. You see how glad we are for that. And so being well pleased is an attribute of, 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 uh, of ecstasy. Miserable people, uh, disgruntled people can never possess ecstasy. It is not possible. Now, this God that we wish to become acquainted with, the God of ecstasy, teaches that when we worship, that our worship should have the tones of ecstasy with it. Now, we don't see much of it today, but God's not to blame. In the Bible, in Psalm 47 and 1, it says, clap your hands. Have you done that lately? Just, <laughs> oh, not to call the dog, but to praise the Lord, to clap your hands. In Psalm 150, verse 5, it says, play upon the cymbals. You know, that's these big pieces of metal that you, you clang them together. He says, make a noise unto me. Let the cymbals praise me. And this is what we call ecstatic worship. And then he says in 1 Peter 1 and 8, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You see, rejoicing has to do with ecstasy. And the Bible teaches that the God of ecstasy wants to bring this ecstasy into human beings and that you should worship him with ecstatic worship, not dead worship. No, but ecstatic worship. And Ecclesiastes 3, and we don't have time to read it, read verse 1 through verse 4, you'll find that God wants you to laugh, to laugh. That laughing has to do with worship. That laughing has to do with worship. Some people think that a, that, that a cold face and, and, uh, and, and a precise look has to do with worship, that you look reverent. <laughs> yeah, you don't find that in the Bible. That comes from man, and it comes from, from the wrong place. You better believe it. Uh, in Ephesians 5 and 19, it says, sing and enter this ecstasy. For us to sing unto the Lord. And how beautiful it is that we can, that we can sing. And if I can go a little further with you, in Psalm 154, it says dance. Dance unto the Lord. I know the devil has stole the dancing. It belongs to God. And in heaven we'll dance. In hell they won't dance at all. Nothing to dance about. God gave ecstasy at the great crises in the Bible. In the great crisis of the Bible, there was always ecstasy. When God delivered the people of Israel from Egypt, the Israelites danced and played tambourines. That's in Exodus 15:1. It says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel, they sang. And this song unto the Lord they sang and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The Lord, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, of, uh, a habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. And then in verses 20 of that, 21 of that same chapter, and Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a, a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he had tramped gloriously. The horse and his rider are thrown into the sea. What a crisis when a nation was being born. Tremendous crisis. And yet, at that point, they had ecstasy. When God gave the law on the Mount Sinai, there was great rejoicing. When the temple was dedicated under Solomon and consecrated in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, there was great rejoicing, tremendous rejoicing. When Christ was born, even the angels sang. And, and Luke 2, 13 and 14, the angels said, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And uh, they, were, they were making a loud noise unto the Lord. When the church was born in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, there was great rejoicing. There was physical emotion and joy at that time. And we learn in the Bible that at the millennium time, uh, when there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, that we shall rejoice and be glad. And what a, what a great joy that is. And God gives ecstasy of, of the Spirit. God gives you the ecstasy that he has in his own spirit. Moses had it in the mountain. Ezekiel had it by the river in Babylon. David had it as he washed his sheep in the field. Solomon had it in his palace in prayer. Paul had it when he was praying in Arabia. God gives this ecstasy in our spirits. That not only does God have it, we have it. You can have it. If you don't have it, he will give it to you today. God will give all of the blessings that he has ever, all the blessings that he has ever given. God will give them today. In the book of Revelation, you will find that God forever 
and ever gives ecstasy. The whole book of Revelation in the, in the, in the end of the, of, the, of the righteous people, of the good people that live with God forever, it's ec ecstatic. They're singing and praising God forever. Now, if that be true, we might as well have it here. The purpose of ecstasy is that too many sad people are in our pews at church. In many churches, they're depressed. You go into there and it's a cloud over the entire audience of depression, of sadness in the church. Now, God does not want this. God does not want this. God wants joy in our hearts. God wants great joy in our hearts. God wants you to have joy, beautiful joy. Won't you let Jesus Christ do that for you today? Won't you come to know the God of peace, the God of joy? Won't you come to know him? And won't you come to let him bless you today in a very real and wonderful and mighty way? I want you to. I want you to right now. And I wish to, to bless you. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of sharing honesty with these friends, sincerity with these friends, and ecstasy that of a truth inside of me personally, I have joy. I have continuous joy. I have joy every day of my life. I don't live under any cloud. I live in the golden sunlight of God. And I ask you this moment to bless these, my neighbors, right now, in Jesus' name. I want you to have joy in your life this moment. Please receive it from Jesus Christ, who loves you and cares for you. Receive it now with all your heart.